dear viewers, dear members, and uh, other colleagues from uh, FDI community, I uh, would like to make first a warm welcome to all of you who are uh, joining us today. Um, we have uh, over 300 registered participants, which uh, gives us a pretty good overview um, that uh, the topic that we will be presenting today with our speakers is um, really an urgent one and it's an interesting one. Um, it's widely spread, the participants are widely spread from all around the world. They are coming from all around the world and they come from different uh, institutions. Uh, majority, of course, are our dear members and other investment promotion agencies, but we have as well participants uh, from other uh, FDI stakeholders like intergovernmental organizations, some of them from businesses and some of them as well from other consulting uh, and big, let's say, uh, consulting companies. Uh, we, we find ourselves in really unprecedented times and the recent published um, UNCTAD's uh, World Investment Report 2020 um, forecasts that FDI flows will decrease by up to 40% in 2020. Uh, from their 2019 value of um, roughly $1.5 trillion. So uh, it looks like that this will bring FDI below $1 trillion for the first time since 2005. So in addition, FDI is projected to decrease by another 5 to 10% in 2021 uh, and to initiate a recovery is predicted in 2022. So it means that uh, investment promotion agencies, IPAs, have now real opportunity to position themselves to support their governments and existing and potential investors further effectively and efficiently. Uh, so as such, we would like to look today at how this future might look for IPAs. And we all know that IPAs shall and will step up the game uh, and we at WIPA and all our, let's say, consultative committee, which consists of OECD, World Bank, uh, UNCTAD, UNIDO, uh, International Chamber of Commerce, will definitely firmly support them in this, in this uh, game. Uh, so uh, thank you very much again for joining us today in the webinar titled, How is COVID-19 impacting the future of FDI and how should IPAs respond? And one hour webinar that we plan uh, will, will be focused on the impact of current challenges in the market on FDI, as well on how IPAs may need to respond. And our uh, speakers and colleagues from IBM PLI will explore how the COVID-19 crisis impacting business and location strategy. How does this relate to transformation of FDI? So which trends and dynamics are already impacting FDI? What changes uh, will we see in the long term? And finally, how IPAs can prepare and respond. So the future marketing strategies, changes to current efforts, opportunities for the new FDI. And just for um, housekeeping rules, after the presentation, we will make a, a couple of minutes for the questions and answers. We, you can, of course, uh, direct the questions and answers under the question and answer um, section. And um, I I'm, will be like a moderator and I will pick up uh, some of the questions at the end and will direct them either to particular speaker or I will choose to whom I will direct and they will try to answer accordingly. Uh, so I would like now to give the word to our colleague, uh, Reul Spe. Uh, Reul is a global leader plant location international at a uh, IBM PLI and worked already together with WIPA in the past on numerous projects. So we are happy that he joins, our, for, uh, joins us for this webinar today. And he will be also joined with two of his colleagues, Kuhn Kuypers, uh, managing consultant, and Jacob Densik, economic research leader, uh, leader. They are both as well from IBM PLI. So Reul, please, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bastian, and uh, good day, everybody. Uh, we're happy to be part of this uh, webinar and talk about how we see, at least expect to see, the future of, uh, of FDI uh, in this uh, in current situation and, and the next uh, number of years uh, and how we think IPA should strategically look forward uh, in, in response to this situation. Um, I'm going to uh, share the screen with you now because we prepared a number of slides and uh, both uh, Jacob, uh, my colleague, and, and Kuhn will uh, present 
uh, as well. So we all three will be speaking, um, uh, but we will only have one, me and myself as a navigator of the slide. So we will refer sometimes to slide numbers. I uh, hope that's all okay to you. So I'm um, going to try and get this for everybody to see. It should be seen now. We just, uh, somebody cannot. Yes, was none. And here it's big enough now. So um, what we're trying to do is in three sections, talk about uh, the, the topic of today. So first, Jacob will talk about what's the situation today, how companies are looking at their business and location strategies and how the COVID-19 crisis, as we call it, uh, is impacting this. Uh, then we'll hand over to Kuhn, who will talk uh, more generally about a number of transformations that we're already seeing, because it's not just the current corona crisis. It, there's a lot of other things already happening, and we refer to that as, as transformation drivers. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in the world for the last number of years and also the years to come that have an impact on FDI and, and on the way companies look at locations and how they make decisions, which is all now going to be accelerated by this current crisis. And I think that's the main thing that we're seeing. Uh, so Kuhn will talk about that. And I will close it then off with, uh, with some remarks about how we think IPRs can respond to this and, and prepare for the future. And it's mostly looking strategically forward. It's not just really looking at today's crisis situation and how you should provide aftercare services right now to the companies who may be in problems. It's more thinking about, okay, how is this in the longer term all going to impact us? And what does it mean for the sectors that we are trying to target or maybe new opportunities that we could have? So that's the three topics that we'd like to cover. We should have enough time for question and answers, and you can submit those with the buttons, as Boshan said, and we hope to pick up a number of those at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Jacob to start the, the first session. Thanks, Raul. Uh, so in this uh, sec uh, section, uh, I'll be uh, talking a bit about some of the changes we're seeing in the business environment that companies operate in, how it's changing their considerations and priorities, and also how it's affecting business strategy, both in the near term and uh, longer term. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, so as, as Bojan alluded to in the beginning, we are really in unprecedented times. Uh, the kind of crisis uh, that uh, companies have had to navigate uh, in recent months has been at a scale and at a speed and also I would say at the geographic reach that is pretty much unprecedented in most of our lifetimes at least. Uh, and it has meant that companies have had to navigate a business environment where the business metrics they're usually used, uh, using to inform themselves and their strategies and their operations have seen shifts that are traumatic to say the least. And the numbers you're seeing there on the slides in the, the graphic are essentially, there's, those are sales numbers, the revenue numbers for different sectors in the US. And you can see that some of them are dropping dramatically, others are seeing a dramatic spike in demand. Uh, uh, so the impact across sectors has varied quite a lot, uh, but it has been disruption that has been the uh, name of the game across all industries. Uh, and companies have had to face up to that uh, and try to address this uh, in the short term as best they can. But what's important to stress, I think, as a lesson that many companies have taken from this is that this traditional way of uh, managing your day-to-day -day operations, but also strategizing about the future where you tend to project from current trends or current numbers is perhaps inadequate and insufficient going forward. And that has had a, a number of implications uh, more fundamentally for how companies may uh, define not just their business models and business strategies, but also their operating models going forward. So if you go to the next slide, Ro. So one of the things, uh, more immediate uh, things that companies obviously have had to deal with is how to maintain operations, maintain business activity, even in the so far as they can, or address various financing issues, uh, employment issues that they've had in, in their organizations uh, to, to, uh, to survive in some cases in, in the short term. But it's also had implications uh, for how they look towards the future and, and what they see as main business priorities going forward. And the numbers here are actually from, we have uh, uh, within IBM uh, and our research organization, Institute for Business Value, we have uh, surveyed thousands of companies over these last three or four months to understand 
across industries, how their priorities are changing, how their focus is changing. And you are seeing a very dramatic shift. Uh, you are seeing companies becoming a lot more aware of the need for resiliency in a, in, a, in a broad sense that this is not just about optimizing your current operations. It's really about understanding how you can create a business model, business strategy and operating model that allows you to thrive going forward, given this uncertainty that they're now facing. And you see that in the kind of uh, business competences that they will also prioritize going forward. So some of these things that are typically capabilities you need to be resilient as an organization, such as enterprise risk management, business continuity, uh, workforce safety and security, areas that perhaps have not been given the, the level of priority it should in the past are now really in focus. Uh, and over the next two years, if you look at how, what they, uh, uh, you're looking at the ranking there of, of priorities, you see some of these uh, uh, capabilities, more than 90% of companies are saying this will be a significant or very uh, priority or be prioritized to a very great extent over the next two years. And that, of course, will have a number of implications for how they structure their international operating models as well, and therefore also how they approach their investments and facilities around the world uh, and, and the risk profile they're willing to accept uh, within uh, that global operating model. If we go to the next um, slide, Raw. Now, the way this will uh, be channeled into investment decisions and investment levels going forward will obviously also depend to some extent on how companies perceive the medium term future. Uh, so what kind of recovery uh, are we going to see from this in economic terms uh, uh, once we have come through the immediate uh, health crisis and, 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 and disruptions associated with, with the COVID-19? What are the economic implications of this and how quickly uh, will the economy recover? Uh, now, we're not going to go into sort of projections here around whether we're going to see a V, U, L shape. I mean, economists have used the whole alphabet of forecasts uh, to uh, uh, discuss what kind of recovery we might have and when it might take place or when it will not take place. Uh, but the important thing to understand, I think, is that uh, these different views of the medium term will have significant implications for investment levels and certainly the willingness of companies to invest and how they approach their international operations. So if it's gonna be a very quick V-shaped recovery, uh, the longer term uh, or medium and longer term implications for investment may be limited. You may see an immediate uh, pause in investment as, as they put uh, plans on hold. Uh, but for those companies that uh, survive and, and manage uh, to, to get through these six months or whatever it is uh, of, of economic disruption, they may then go back to normal if there is this uh, very rapid V-shaped recovery. Now, if you see a longer term issue in the economy and perhaps some longer term implications for the economy coming out of this in, for example, a U shape or L shape where, uh, where the recovery is not as fast. And also there will be some significant implications for output growth going forward. Uh, then companies will react in a different way. They will, will not only uh, pause investment, they will also cancel. They may make more significant restructurings to their global uh, operations and, and, and reduce uh, their exposure in certain uh, geographies and their investment levels. They may also re-engineering, restructure their supply chains in response to this very different economic environment coming out. So the nature of the recovery, uh, the, the speed at which it takes place, and also the longer term implications of the recovery, uh, and, and notably the impact on longer term growth, will to, to a large extent dictate what type of investment, what, what, pro, what will prioritize that investment, and what will be the focus for that investment going forward. Uh, so, it, so that's important to keep in mind and companies will certainly be looking at this in, in the medium term. If we go to the next slide, Rob. Um, but there are also some significant longer term implications for companies as they address this. Uh, and this is, goes to some very fundamental principles around how you develop business strategy and location strategy for that matter um, uh, and how it's framed. Uh, if we look at how we have worked with companies and also with IPAs around strategy development, and we know this has been so dominant within business strategy development for a long time, uh, we tend to start with the current state and the current trends and project forward towards the target state that we would like to achieve, and then understand what kind of roadmap or actions we need to take to get there. 
Uh, and within an environment that is fairly stable, or at least reasonably predictable, uh, that kind of approach has served companies very well, and therefore also other organizations very well. But if we are moving to a much more uncertain environment and the current crisis is merely symptomatic of a much more elevated level of risk uh, or, uh, that, that companies have to get used to where these kind of occurrences and disruptions take place more frequently and, and have more severe implications. And that doesn't just have to be health uh, uh, pandemics. It can also be risks related to climate change, environmental risk, uh, uh, natural disasters, uh, cybersecurity, terrorism, et cetera. If the overall risk profile of the global economy is enhanced and elevated, companies may have to change this way to, to business strategy. You may have to turn it on its head and say, actually, we cannot just project on current trends. We have to think about radically different alternative future scenarios. And from those different longer term scenarios, work our way backwards as to what they mean for our current operations and what actions we have to take to become truly resilient. And when uh, we talk about resilience in that context, it's about how you are able to thrive and succeed across different types of future potential scenarios and not just optimize within any given type of scenario. Uh, and that is where resiliency may take precedence over efficiency for companies going forward. They may be willing to sacrifice um, uh, operating cost advantages, uh, efficiency gains in order to be able to succeed and thrive in, in radically different business environments going forward and have that resiliency. And that will have dramatic implications also for their global operations and how they locate activities around the world. And to what extent, you, for example, concentrate activities within one geography or spread it across many geographies and, and take the added cost that comes with that. It also has significant implications for how companies will weigh uh, criteria, qualitative criteria that creates a more stable and resilient business environment for them to operate in versus cost efficiencies, et cetera. So this way of thinking and this significant change in how companies will approach business strategy. And by the way, this is a way that we are working a lot with companies around their location and business strategies at the moment, where lots of discussions with companies around their business strategy are focused on this scenario envisioning, scenario planning approach, where you're taking a radically different approach uh, than you have in the past. And if we go to the next, um, uh, this is an example of how, how you can then think about these different futures and what the implications are for your company and for your operations and therefore also your investment going forward. And, and the way we, uh, we typically do this is to define a couple of dimensions that will dictate these radically different futures. Uh, and here you see two dimensions. One relates to the, uh, the level uh, and depth of disruptions because of physical health and environmental risks on the one hand. And the other dimension is how the international governance system responds to this. Uh, so are we gonna have an environment where you have uh, continuous and severe disruptions like these going forward or very limited? In other words, was this a one-off or are we gonna see many of these types of uh, disruptions going forward? And the other dimension is then, how do we respond to this as an international community? Our, our, our international institutions, our international governance mechanisms, the way we trade and integrate our economy gonna be maintained. Or are we going to see a reversal back into more uh, isolationist uh, uh, responses where com uh, countries are going to start uh, moving away from this, these international government mechanisms and institutions and our ability to come up with cooperative uh, and, and uh, coordinated action in response to these crises may also be limited as a result of that. And indeed, the international trading regimes and international financial markets may dis be disrupted as a result of this as well. And looking to the future through those two lenses gives us different scenarios of how the future might turn out. So in the top right corner, you have very limited risks. Uh, so essentially what we have been through the last few months is, is a one-off and, we, and we're not gonna see many uh, of these types of risks going forward. And at the same time, the global economy is gonna continue to be integrated. Companies are gonna be able to trade, take advantage of global supply chains and international finance markets in the way they operate. Uh, the other extreme alternative uh, opposite scenario of this is a situation where actually this, this type of risk that we've got, this type of disruption that we've gone through now is symptomatic of something more fundamental. We're going to see more of these type of risks going forward. So as a company, 
we're going to be faced with a lot of this type of disruption. In addition, uh, the global governance mechanisms that have been in place to allow us to operate as global companies are also going to be weakened. Uh, and we're going to therefore see less opportunities for tapping into international supply chain, less opportunities for tapping into international markets and international resources and talent pools in the way we operate. And therefore, we're not only faced with higher risks, our ability to navigate that risk is also fundamentally changed. And we have to uh, revert back into more nationally confined operating models where we're looking at how we can create successful operations within different individual geographies. And then, of course, you have two uh, uh, in-between scenarios of like where one has a lot of disruption, uh, but has uh, still the international uh, talent pools, the international markets to, uh, to tap into. And another one where you don't have so much disruption, but, uh, but the international order is sort of uh, fragmented. Now, the reason for looking at this way is not to say one of these scenarios is, is necessarily more likely than the other. They're not necessarily even fully realistic scenarios. They are archetypes of potential futures that allow us to think uh, in a strategic way and, uh, and in a very structured way around what different futures there might be or what different future realities may, uh, may be the case for us as a company. And therefore, how can we create an international operating model and a business strategy that allows us to thrive irrespective of which direction of travel the world economy is going in. If, if, if everything stays the same and they're not a uh, successful risk, how, uh, how are we gonna be able to succeed in that as well as being able to succeed if some of these more fundamental changes are taking place. So, uh, uh, and, and each of these uh, uh, situations will have implications for our operating model and we have to create an international operating model and footprint of operations that allows us to thrive across each of these uh, types of scenarios. And how that manifests itself in FDI and, and how it might accelerate certain trends that we're seeing in the market is that there's something Kuhn will now talk to and I will hand over to him for the next section. Yeah, hello everyone and thank you Jacob. Um, so indeed, so how this now will, uh, to evaluate how these different realities and these different scenarios potentially will impact um, FDI, we would say that we need to take a step back first, and uh, we can go to the next slide, I think, um, uh, to really understand first um, what is actually driving um, FDI, what is, what is driving volume and, uh, and, and trends in, in FDI. And to do so, we basically identified and classified a number of, uh, we've called them transformation drivers. Um, that, and these are basically dynamics and, and events that drive FDI at, let's say, at the global level. They're also current, so, so they are already in existing, they're relevant, and they are expected to have a long-term impact. And um, as you can see, we've identified quite a diverse set, 36 in total. And um, we've classified them in four groups, basically, uh, quite a large technology group, um, then a societal group, uh, exogenous group, um, and then also an, a purely economics uh, group. Um, and just to give a few examples of what we basically mean with these drivers, and on the next page, uh, for instance, the, the, the trade wars driver, uh, which, which is an, an element that was quite relevant the last few years, eh, where we've seen basically um, trade barriers, trade tariffs going up, uh, mostly between US and China. And of course, that has a very direct impact on how companies uh, have to operate their supply chains and how they have to structure their footprints also going forward. And I said that it also has a direct impact on economic development in many countries um, around the world. And then a, uh, a second one, uh, perhaps uh, cybersecurity, uh, there has been um, quite a lot of focus um, in recent years on um, uh, protection of data um, and increasingly also protection of privacy, certainly after the introduction of GDPR in uh, the EU. Uh, and as such, this cybersecurity and data protection is not something only for IT companies anymore. Eh? So it's basically most companies around across most industries now need to uh, focus on this and need to invest in uh, acquiring the relevant solutions and skills to be able to cope with this uh, trend and with this driver. Um, and maybe we can go to the, the next slide. Um, to, to illustrate now also how do these transformation drivers then um, impact companies and industries. So first of all, that impact 
uh, will be dependent on the industry that you're looking at. And you need to understand those differences between the industries. Yeah? Again, the trade wars are perhaps a good example uh, where tariffs are, of course, linked with products and product groups. And so as such, se sectors that are linked with those products will be impacted, while others may completely not be impacted. Yeah? So there's clear differentiation between industries. And secondly, also the way that these drivers may disrupt industri industries will be uh, dependent on which part of the value chain that's, that is impacted. So for instance, a driver may impact only one part of the value chain, like only manufacturing operations, for instance, or it may really impact the full value chain and may lead to a full rethink of your business model. Huh? So, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence is a driver where we would expect to see quite a broad impact across the value chain. And then finally, uh, the, the impact that transformation drivers have is, is also dependent on the reality you're looking at. So on the scenario that you're looking at, uh, like Jacob explained, or of course also on the, the elements that you're currently experiencing. Like, for instance, in this case, at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, will have an impact on how these transformation drivers play out. But we'll come back on that later on. Now, um, what type of impact can, can we expect from these drivers? So first of all, the most direct and obvious impact is the appearance of uh, entirely new segments uh, from an FDI perspective. Um, they're typically linked with technology areas uh, like, uh, for instance, um, blockchain or social media or 5G. And so these are areas that now create projects that create jobs. Uh, maybe not a lot yet, uh, but it is a new opportunity that didn't exist a, a, a few years ago. Um, and then another area uh, is new business or product areas that are impacted by potential transformation drivers. And so for, we've mentioned an example of a, um, an industrial machinery manufacturer that um, also transforms itself into a service provider based on uh, the monetization of consumer data, uh, which is also one of the drivers that we've identified. And of course, then that uh, manufacturer also may have uh, different location requirements than in the past. And that's also basically where we see the more fundamental impact from these transformation drivers. And uh, we can go to the next slide uh, because the fundamental impact that we see from transformation drivers is uh, both on the investment drivers so the investment behavior. So why do invest, uh, companies make investments? And as well on the location decision-making drivers, so location requirements. Uh, we've summarized a few few potential impacts of transformation drivers on investment drivers in, in the table here on this slide. And just as an example, so for instance, artificial intelligence, robotics and automation is, is, is widely expected to basically reduce the, the focus of uh, investment on efficiency seeking only investment and increase the focus on access to skills, access to knowledge and insight. Um, and that, of course, um, will also lead to differences and changes in location requirements uh, from, from a company point of view. Uh, so for instance, companies may increasingly look at the level of skills that is available, the infrastructure quality perhaps, perhaps also the um, property right protection and intellectual property right protection. Um, and also what also might change is that other uh, locations may become um, relevant options to invest. Uh, so for instance, when a company was in the past mainly for certain operations looking at lower cost locations, now maybe also higher quality, higher cost locations may become an option based on this driver. Yeah? So that's quite a, a substantial change. And then uh, another example is electrification, where we where we can see now already uh, that um, the way an automotive, for instance, automotive industry, uh, where the, the automotive powertrain is manufactured, is substantially different than from the past. Uh, so with also substantial different needs and requirements with respect to skills and uh, technology and available resources. And so therefore, again, different and new locations may become very relevant for these automotive companies based on this driver. And as such, the result may be a very different uh, automotive global supply chain. Um, so, and maybe we can go to the uh, next slide first. How does this now um, links back with those different scenarios that, that Jacob explained and also with the current crisis that we're experiencing? Well, what basically a crisis like, uh, like COVID-19 does is it changes the direction, um, the speed, and also the nature that the impact of these transformation drivers have. Huh? So for instance, just as an exercise, we've, I, we've, we've, we've looked at, okay, which 
do we see as key transformation drivers now during the COVID-19 crisis? Eh? So for instance, what you're seeing is that um, everything that relates to technologies that enable um, remote ways of working, remote ways of operating, um, have been imp implemented in a, in a dramatically accelerated uh, manner. Eh? Um, another example would be, the, the, of course, uh, quite obviously the health risk awareness driver, eh? um, um, which is of course a key, a key element in, in, in the current crisis, eh? both from a consumer point of view, because it has changed um, how and where consumption is taking place, but also from an employee perspective, um, uh, because um, uh, it has completely, uh, it, it has refocused um, and, and enabled, accelerated the, 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 the adoption of remote working. Uh, and as such, again, it will also have a, have a substantial impact on location requirements that companies have. Uh, again, infrastructure quality may become more important. They may have changing real estate needs uh, because of um, social distancing, um, uh, et cetera. So, and then the, um, the, the final driver that I want to mention here um, is the globalization driver, uh, which we also see key here, but with a different interpretation and with a different nature of impact. Uh, because uh, what the current crisis has made clear is that um, that companies need to make their supply chains increasingly resilient and as such risk avoidance need to become part of the overall uh, equation of the overall future decision making and and of course this may lead to potentially actually more complex and more differentiated supply chains and this may be uh, can be seen as a threat for a certain country certain location but at the same time it can also be uh, turn out to be uh, really an opportunity. And this then indeed links with um, responsibilities of IPA and how do we see that, how, what IPAs can do to build on this, to build on these potential opportunities and to really get an understanding how do we need to refocus their efforts uh, to be, let's say, successful in this dramatically changed uh, environment. And, and that's something that, that, that Ru will now explain in a bit more detail in the, in the last and third section. Yeah, thank you, Kuhn. Um, so yeah, the, what, you, what you just heard was talking about uh, uh, more generic transformation drivers and all kinds of natures that we've already seen and there are impacting FDI. Um, and there are now either change in direction or accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis. And I'd like to talk now a little bit of what that means for IPAs who will have to decide on their strategy moving forward and trying to attract uh, new companies or trying to retain existing companies and so on. So basically what we uh, have identified is uh, that there are three main actions uh, required in, in this situation. And this is apart from the current uh, activities related to aftercare that we think every IPA should already be actively involved in. And I know many IPAs are uh, very, maybe 100% focused even at this moment in time on aftercare services to their existing industries. We're mostly talking here about the longer term what is it that you need to do when all these changes are taking effect and where new opportunities are emerging or where uh, certain uh, risks are, are leading to uh, uh, negative impacts on your local economies. So the three things that we've listed and I'll talk to each of these in a bit more detail in a moment is, is first of all, how to, to assess what these changes that, that, that Kun and Jacob just talked about, how are they affecting the sectors that are currently uh, perceived by yourselves uh, as, as your strengths. Uh, what the target sectors that you typically are focusing on, either because you have a strong cluster or because you have a strong opportunity, you think in the future for attracting those sectors. What, what is happening with those sectors in the number of years? Uh, and how is that, uh, how, is, how are they impacted by the current dynamics in the market? And what does that then mean ne uh, next uh, with, for your location proposition? Uh, do you still have the same proposition as today or is that proposition perhaps changing either for the good or for the bad and what that uh, what they then should do about that but also what new opportunities may there emerge from this upcoming transformation who mentioned a couple of these technology drivers are actually leading to new segments of industry and normally what you see and we've seen this over the years when when new technologies emerge like bi biotechnology 20 years ago this is a very slow process of a new subsector of industry emerging as a real um, target sector that's going to create volumes of FDI in the future. This is now going much faster than we saw in the past. Had these new technology sectors, two years ago we said, well, 
they may create jobs in the longer term, but they're all pretty small at the moment. There's not that many projects. But what we're already seeing that this is going much faster. And artificial intelligence is a very good example. I think it's not even a year ago that I myself mentioned a number of times in presentations that this is, yes, this is a new technology, this is becoming important, but there are not that many companies in, that are individually purely focused on artificial intelligence and that are really creating new projects and new jobs. Well, one year later, I already have to change that opinion because I see a lot of companies already transforming and, and creating new jobs and creating volumes and larger projects with many jobs. So that is an example of a sector that's already quickly uh, uh, coming up in, in the current situation, much faster than we thought. A second key action that we want to list is really that you have to then think about refreshing your marketing strategy and related to that, your resource allocations, budgets, uh, manpower, et cetera, to these changes eh? in response to the sectors that create new opportunities or perhaps the sectors that you were strong in, but that are showing maybe uh, negative uh, future uh, imp uh, implications. And, and the third component is then also to look at, are there any requirements uh, in terms of new improvements in our business environments that we need to uh, initiate uh, based on the changes, change proposition that we, that we have. So let's, let's talk a little bit about each of these three components. The first thing I wanna show is, this, is the changes that we have in, in propositions in various of these examples. And what we wanna show here is a couple of, um, of, of proposition maps. We call these the cost quality maps. And, and I, I know a number of you will recognize this, but maybe also a number will not recognize this. Um, this is a typical example that, uh, that I know many consultants nowadays use in, in the location strategy business. Uh, to plot locations uh, that are potential options for a company to consider. Uh, and this is a methodology to, to basically identify a short list of best locations. And these dots on the map there represent countries or cities, uh, whatever the company is looking at. And the scales actually represent a quality of these locations and a cost of, of doing business in these locations. So on the bottom axis, you will see, you see mentioned there lowest cost. So that reflects uh, an analysis of operational costs. So the locations to the right are the lower cost uh, solutions for this particular operation. And on the other axis, you will see best quality. So that's a quality summary, a quality index, if you will, of a number of more qualitative requirements that the company has. This is related to labor availability, the quality of labor, infrastructure, regulatory issues, stability factors, et cetera, et cetera. So, Everything that's non-cost related is actually summarized in that quality index. And if you, if you do your analysis uh, and, and you plot the locations on these, all these factors, but then bring it together in this cost quality map, you will typically see how locations compare to each other on quality and cost dimensions. But you can also then as a company see what is the trade-off between those two dimensions and all these locations. And what you see reflected here roughly is that there is often a trade-off between the quality and the cost factor. So the higher quality locations on the left typically are also more expensive locations. And lower cost locations on, on, the, on the right of this graph are typically lower cost for a reason because they have a weaker business environment. So that trade-off is what you very often see on, on, these, on these types of analysis. And obviously you'd like to have solutions on the upper right, which reflect a very good quality location, but also very cost attractive. And that doesn't happen often. It does occasionally happen, but doesn't happen often. There's usually this trade-off. Now, what we want to show here, if you understand this concept of the cost and quality analysis is that propositions may change. So the cross that you see there, the location, there's a location with the, with, a, with the star indicated to the right. It's actually a location that has a profile of a low cost location, so cost efficient. Uh, but also you uh, will compromise uh, uh, as a company in, in that location on a number of the qualitative requirements. But that may be okay for a number of operations. So if we take the example here of a, a fairly straightforward assembly operation, let's say electronic components assembly, um, uh, where, where maybe some of the qualitative requirements are not that crucial and it's really cost, uh, cost driven, that may be the right proposition that the company is looking for. Now, countries that have that kind of uh, proposition for, for, let's say, for this electronics assembly industry may have a good opportunity for that, for that industry. Uh, but as a result of these changes in the market, it may be that, and let's say because of automation, uh, 
uh, that that operation in the future will not need that many people anymore, a, lot, a smaller workforce than today. If that is the case, then the, the workforce requirements will change and particularly the cost aspect of that workforce will be become less important. Uh, and once that, that, that kind of a change uh, happens in the requirements of a company, the whole balance of the factors is going to change. Uh, the cost factors will change because if labor costs become less important, then maybe the other factors become relatively more important, say transportation or real estate or utilities. And so that balance in within the cost factors changes, but also the balance with the qualitative factors probably change because if you need less people, uh, and the volume of labor doesn't necessarily uh, isn't that that's so so important anymore. The whole human resources aspect becomes a lower priority than versus other factors than than was the case. So as a result of that that changing of location requirements, the proposition of this particular location may become weaker because it may uh, not be as much the low cost opportunity anymore that it was today. And so that's an example of how a, a change could happen. In this case, because uh, the labor cost factor becomes less important. Um, another example here is where a location has a fairly good quality proposition, uh, and that could actually become even more important because let's say if this is a, a, a we called it an example here, high tech, high volume manufacturing project where uh, as a result of the changes on labor requirements, uh, you don't need that many people anymore. You may maybe look more at higher quality of people and maybe less, but more quality people, uh, which often also means that you are going to look at more educational institutes that you require for your location, etc. So the qualitative requirements become a bit more important perhaps. And some locations may see as a result of that, that their proposition becomes stronger for this kind of operation because of these changes. And so that's, that could be a new opportunity for, for marketing. Uh, here's an, uh, an example where you would have a fairly balanced proposition and say more or less uh, along this axis of cost and quality, you have a nice balance between the two factors uh, where you have an opportunity maybe in one of these new technology domains, um, which is a bit of an untapped uh, area still for many IPAs to look into, where you become more attractive as a result of the changes in the market. And here's a final example where the opposite occurs. And say, for example, a, a, what we've seen in the last number of years is the larger delivery centers um, that, that went to India and the Philippines, typically driven by lower cost uh, opportunities. Sometimes we're looking at very low cost solutions, sometimes looking at more the balance proposition. If you had some more, let's say, uh, uh, more strict labor requirements, um, that balance proposition may uh, become a bit more less uh, interesting when the company changes its focus from global delivery centers or large regional centers towards more smaller region or even domestic delivery centers, that whole proposition then changes for these locations. Uh, and for some, it may be to the good, and, but for some, it may also be for the, for the bad. So these are just a number of examples of how these propositions of locations can be impacted by the changes of requirements that companies have uh, or will have in the next number of years as a result of, of these transformations. Um, so what that means is looking into these propositions as an IPA and what are the, the propositions that are perhaps at risk in your location and what are maybe the new upcoming uh, opportunities and propositions. And then really look at your marketing strategy and refresh that uh, looking at perhaps the current sectors that you're looking at uh, today, uh, examples uh, that you see listed here, these are just a couple of examples where you would look at what, what, what is actually today's situation and what is the situation that we think uh, will be the, the case in the future and what does it then mean for that particular target sector in our future strategy. So if you take the automotive there as the first one, and that may be a sector that's, that's a target sector for many IPAs at the moment, say for this particular situation, we took a, a region that where the existing cluster of automotive is strong. Huh? That's one of the reasons that this, in this case, it is a target sector. But then if we look at the opportunities and the changes in that market, uh, there's quite some uh, challenges at the moment for the automotive industry. Uh, it may be that the conclusion is that the market outlook for that industry for uh, your location is not that strong and your proposition therefore is weakening. 
now for your future strategy, that may mean that you have to maybe switch from a active, proactive or reactive marketing strategy into a retention focus, uh, because it's still a strong cluster in your area, but it may be that you have to take more care of the existing companies that you have today, rather than trying to attract new industries uh, in, that, uh, in that particular target sector, because that the outlook and your proposition uh, may, may tell you different. Uh, other examples there are maybe, uh, say, life sciences uh, where the existing cluster is reasonably strong, where the market outlook is very strong because uh, a lot of changes are going to that direction. And that may be that your FDI proposition uh, is, is certainly still strong, and that means it requires more proactive focus, or deserves it at least. And so you could look that way at your current target sectors and see how the, uh, the future outlook may uh, lead to some changes or redirection of your strategy, but there may also be some new opportunities coming up as a result of the current dynamics. And I've listed two examples here, data centers and, and FinTech, for example, not, not surprisingly too in that technology domain, where there's a lot of activity at the moment and certainly will increase in the future. And so data centers here as an example, it may not be an existing strong cluster for many locations yet, uh, the market outlook, however, is, is very strong, and I guess that's the case across the world. But your I FDI proposition may not be as strong yet because it's a fairly new, underdeveloped uh, uh, sector in, in many countries still. Uh, but there the conclusion could be, well, given that there is a strong outlook for that sector and there's enough, let's say, investment volume coming up to tap into, this may be a sector to explore in the future strategy. And, and the same example there for FinTech, a new example. So this kind of analysis could make you decide to make some adjustments uh, to your uh, strategy, strategic focus on sectors between retention, proactive marketing, and reactive marketing. Um, and then also uh, related to that, make adjustments to the resource allocation, it depends on, on, on in terms of um, uh, budgets and, and workforce uh, dedicated to each of these sectors, uh, if, if you're following that kind of model. So that's that's a thing to do, and and a, and a last thing to look into then is also to look at uh, how do we potentially need to uh, improve our proposition for some of these industries uh, by making some changes in the business environment. Uh, so there could be uh, uh, some changes coming up, and that make you decide that uh, that you need some um, some infrastructure improvements, some workforce improvements, etc., to become more competitive or to stay competitive for a certain certain industry. And if I try to highlight that here again with this, this cost quality uh, proposition, where on the left uh, graph, you see a, a, let's say, current status type of analysis. And we've, we've used Addis Ababa, Ethiopia here as an example with a location that this, uh, this analysis has a proposition that is mostly based on, on lower cost. Uh, for uh, in this case computer manufacturing and co computer and computer equipment. But as a result of a number of changes uh, that you could define, in, in, uh, in terms of workforce and infrastructure and real estate and so on, could improve its proposition qualitatively in this case uh, towards a, a stronger proposition definitely and, and compete with a number of locations that are in that upper right quadrant. So that's a kind of example that you could, uh, could look into to, um, to improve the business environment and your proposition therefore for industries in this particular sector. So those are three key actions that we think are relevant for IPAs to look into uh, in the current situation, this current crisis situation. And as, as explained, it's not only by the COVID-19 crisis, but it's actually also by a lot of the drivers, uh, transformation drivers that we were already seeing and that have an impact, but are just being accelerated by this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, here are some final, summar final summary of the key observations that we have made. I'm not going to repeat them again, but in the interest of time, I'm going to hand it uh, back to uh, Bastian now to, uh, to see if we can still have some time for, uh, for Q&A at the end of, uh, of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all three of you. Um, actually, I'm sure that our participants um, get some very good insights and uh, the, your analysis is, I would say, very deep and it really reflects all the challenges that are going on. What, what I heard actually uh, from all three of you is uh, a long-term planning. Um, there will be one question actually that, that I would uh, directly um, direct to Jacob um, because you've been speaking on a long-term different scenarios and let's say maybe even resilience instead of efficiency. 
Um, um, one participant asked, uh, for example, um, the saying, the future is what we make out of it. Is it still valid or not? And it was an interesting question. So I believe it requires uh, some explanation maybe. Please go yeah. ahead, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, we, we shouldn't dismiss our ability to still shape our own, our, our futures. But I think if, if we are moving, and it's still an if, of course, but if, if the premise we move forward with is that uh, we are moving towards a more elevated risk environment where this type of disruptions may become more frequent uh, uh, and, and they are unpredictable by their nature. Uh, we, we have to uh, prepare for the future in a way that makes us more resilient. And, and, and the emphasis there is, if you look at, a, at, a, at how a lot of companies have approached their operations and their business strategies in recent years, I, it, it's been very much focused on optimizing, becoming more efficient, but they've work, been working with a given set of assumptions. I think this has shaken that belief a bit that we can just hold these assumptions around how the world economy will operate. And we may have to build in more resiliency in our supply chains, in our operations to allow us to be able to survive uh, in some cases as a company, even if those fundamental assumptions shift like they have done in, the, in recent months. So we are still able to uh, shape our future. Uh, we are still able to uh, prepare for it, but we may have to do it differently. I think. Excellent. Uh, Rural, there was one question you partly answered, actually. One uh, participant asked, uh, especially about the automobile sector, uh, the companies are thinking about maybe geographical relocation. So you, you said, of course, there is a, um, uh, should be focus on retention. So because the, the participant asked how to target them, can you maybe elaborate a bit more? Because we all know that the automobile sector was pretty much uh, affected, actually. Yeah. Well, the automotive sector is, is a very good example of uh, changes that are already going on. Uh, transformation in that industry is enormous. Uh, there were some problems, of course, uh, with the software issues that we had, but particularly the self-driving car, the electricity, it, electrical cars um, are transforming the whole industry. And, and it's really traditional companies are competing with, with uh, IT companies now, uh, technology companies uh, in, in the car industry. So that industry is transforming tremendously, and that's now also going to be accelerated by this new crisis. Um, so I would say that, that countries or regions that have uh, heavily relied or have become heavily depending on the automotive industry, the traditional automotive industry, really have to look into that situation. And, and indeed, their uh, first, I think, first of all, the retention strategy will become very important for them. If you look at a country this is two examples, actually, a smaller country and a larger country. Slovakia has become a very strong concentration of uh, automotive industry over the years. Uh, that's a small country, uh, and it means small country with a strong uh, single industry is, is by nature almost uh, very depending on that, uh, on that industry. So that has certainly ha would have to look into it. But the other one is a much bigger one, is Mexico. Uh, Mexico has really uh, attracted a huge amount of uh, automotive industry, but all fairly much in, in the traditional uh, business model in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, and if you look at the, the FDI statistics that we collect a lot, uh, the data on, on greenfield investment projects, um, I think it's, uh, there were years that 80% of the job creation in FDI in Mexico was driven by the, the broader automotive cluster. That shows how dependent that country has become on that industry. And they definitely need to diversify in terms of their target sector uh, focus, but they will also have to look at that automotive industry and work with the existing industries on retention at the moment and, tr and trying to see if those companies indeed could transform. I'm sure that these companies are looking into that, of course, uh, but they may need help in that regard. Uh, that's, that's the particular focus that, uh, that I wanted to illustrate with that example. Um, another one, uh, Rural, they, they mentioned directly to you. Um, uh, for example, how do you see um, in the future, for example, like speaking a bit about Greenfield or even M&A, for example, there is a question. Uh, is it now time for IPAs to start putting in place M&A strategies? Um, for example, with the onset of the distance economy, tech companies are, as mm -hmm. like your colleagues also identify, going to become the key investors in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can, if you can elaborate a bit on this, uh, it can be an interesting information. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's it's a very different business, eh, M and A uh, versus Greenfield. And I know certainly the traditional IPAs have always been been set up for Greenfield investment attraction. I think a change that we've already seen and which we also encourage is uh, for IPAs definitely to look into partnership uh, uh, types of marketing. Eh? Certainly in this new technology domains, many, many companies are looking for quick access to talents, to competences, to new technologies, and trying to team up with existing companies, startups, uh, et cetera. And, and that you can definitely stimulate a lot with as an IPA uh, to, to, to develop the expertise on those types of new companies and that technology area in those industries. And, and be able to have the conversations with those companies about these partnerships. It also requires, by the way, that as an IPA, you need to develop a very good understanding of the kind of companies and, and educational institutes that you have in your region. And that's, a, that's an area I am uh, honestly not impressed with, uh, in, with most IPAs because they still don't know very often their region very well. So if you're trying to move into that space of trying to develop partnerships, but it certainly also relates to, to M&As. You have to know your industries really very, very, very well. Know what they do, what they can do, what technologies they represent, et cetera, before you can have a conversation with a potential new investor about those companies. Um, the M&As itself, I, mean, I think the partnerships therefore is, is definitely a domain. I would, I would certainly encourage uh, IPAs to look into that. Acquisitions in the, is really a, a different ball game and it's it's also a risky one. I've had lots of conversations with IPAs that were trying to convince me that uh, uh, an acquisition is as uh, uh, valuable as a greenfield investment. I, I certainly do not agree with that. We can, we can all see, look at thousands of examples where companies were acquired and with all good intentions in the first couple of years. But once that first consolidation comes up in crisis situations, an acquired company usually is the first one that is at risk. So um, that's that's a very different area that you that you have to follow a different strategy for, I think. And I'm not an M&A expert, but certainly if you want to move into that space, you need different kinds of expertise in-house. I don't know whether Jacob or Kuhn wants to add something to that. That will be my view. Thank you very much. If anyone else, yeah, Jacob or yeah, maybe. No, I, I would echo Rose's emphasis on, on the partnerships. And that is definitely something uh, in a broad sense, looking at how you can uh, encourage uh, collaboration and, and for foreign companies to engage with your local organizations, your local companies, whether that's also in some cases leading to M&A, that, that could be uh, part of this, but it will require very different capabilities within your organization if you're gonna go down that route. Um, one more goes, obviously, this automobile sector, automotive sector is very popular. Uh, it goes to all three of you. Uh, if you could share any example of examples of destinations where automobile industries has proven to be competitive without draining much needed government revenue sources through incentives. Uh, if there are any concrete examples, this is what I guess the participants ask. Well, I think some of those examples that Ro mentioned before, uh, Slovakia and Mexico, are, are not necessarily primarily attracting investment because of incentives, but because of a, the quality of their proposition that they've had in this segment. And I think those, those locations that are successful over a longer period of time in building up these type of cluster capabilities do so not because uh, of the incentives. The incentives can help to kickstart certain things and, and contribute to something if, if it's done correctly, but is not how you build a sustainable proposition. Uh, and and the, uh, the reasons for companies to go to Mexico have a lot more to do with uh, the access to the North American market, the capabilities and the talent pools, the, the skills and, 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 and wage costs, et cetera, that are available to companies in those locations than the incentives that are on offer. Um, okay, so no, time. yeah, I guess sure. it's more than yeah. good. Thank you very much, Jacob. Yeah. I guess I will uh, give just um, uh, the last question because now we need to wrap up. We, we, we do need to respect uh, the time of the participants and as well to the speakers. Um, Any one of you three, do you think the companies uh, will go very conservative on the outsourcing models irrespective of the labor cost due to pressure from governments? 
I don't think uh, it would only be because of pressure, of, if I can start, <laughs> only be because of pressure of government. I do think there will be a, a reconsideration of how they go offshore versus nearshore and, and onshore in, in their own uh, markets. I, I, I think some companies have burned themselves at being overly exposed uh, to in, in individual offshore locations. And there will be a diversification of that risk profile within the overall operating footprint which means that that's going to be uh, reconsidered. And, it, and that's in part due to the experiences they've had in recent months and not necessarily because of uh, uh, government uh, policies. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Roy, do you have any? Yeah, no, I would, I, would agree, I would agree with that. I, I think there's, there's, a, there's already, maybe not a huge trend, but there's already a movement of companies critically looking at the outsourcing model. I think Mm -hmm. Years ago, there's a number of companies have certainly gone a step too far, I think. Uh, to my opinion, you should outsource whatever is maybe not, I think about outsourcing for whatever, whatever that is not core to your business, but there's certainly not outsource elements that are core to your business. And some companies have, have gone down that route even. Uh, and I will be very careful with that. I think companies have recognized there are certain risks associated with outsourcing, not always the same quality as what you would like to have in your organization. And it's the same with the offshoring. Uh, geographical offshoring. So there is some movement back towards doing more uh, core of the core business yourself and doing more at locations that are closer to you and your key markets. Some of that already started. And again, it's probably an example of a movement that will be accelerated uh, caused by the current situation. Uh, thank you very much um, to all of you. Now I will ask to all the participants and in the meantime, I will uh, now uh, share one poll we would like to understand just it's easier for for the participants to just click uh, how useful uh, this webinar was and i will in meantime uh, just give a final couple of words um, so please take a second actually to um, to just click uh, and to try to see because it's very important for us to understand uh, if this kind of webinars are useful for majority of the participants um, what I heard was actually that um, some couple of uh, things that I would like to mention is, of course, the long-term planning, revisiting the strategies, uh, focusing on new emerging sectors like artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, maybe less focused on efficiency seeking, but more to skills and knowledge. This is what I found it a very, I would say, key message, like... Uh, uh, trying to understand if uh, we as the investment promotion agencies or investment promotion practitioners, do we have enough skills? Do we have a developed, um, uh, let's say, digital uh, platforms and anything that, uh, um, uh, let's say, we need to cope with the future? Um, and I, what I like, uh, it was like uh, you said, I guess, um, I'm not sure who said, low cost, low quality, this is becoming expensive. So we should really um, think uh, what will be, let's say, uh, our new value proposition in the future. And I guess the companies are also looking at it. So we need to speak the language of the investors to be able to cope with this. Um, um, so um, at the end, I would like to really thank you very much, Roel, uh, Jacob and Kuhn. I hope uh, Kuhn is hearing us as well. He had some difficulties before, before but uh, otherwise the colleagues will say we really appreciate. Um, I see that um, uh, uh, over 50% uh, find it extremely useful, uh, this kind of um, uh, presentation that you shared. And I'm, I guess we all agree that we will share, the participants very much ask if we will share, of course, the presentation with them and uh, we will be sharing it and as well the video that was recorded of this webinar later on in our web page or in our uh, YouTube channel. Um, so to all participants, um, I would like as well to thank you for being part of uh, this, uh, let's say, great uh, webinar and uh, we, we would like you to follow our web page where uh, we have not only uh, let's say our current job that we are doing, but you can see also the best practices of IPAs, especially now still related to COVID. Uh, it's, we call it like a COVID-19 platform where you can all still share uh, your views, maybe more related to the future plans. Uh, we are doing some interviews with the heads of IPAs. 
we will be having, uh, we will be continuing making this kind of webinars. Obviously, they are very useful, with especially with our partners uh, from our consultative committee. Um, today, again, thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues from the IBM PLI, uh, for your uh, for your really uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I guess we all learned enormously a lot uh, from, especially from the deep uh, analysis that you did and you provided some very concrete um, ideas what IPAs should focus on in the future. Uh, so with, with this, um, I would end this webinar and um, thank you all again for participating and listening and watching us. And do follow us in our social media and our web page uh, where we will be posting our new activities, our new webinars in the future. Um, and I guess, uh, dear panelists, you would agree if there is anything that um, uh, participants would like to, they can also uh, get in touch with you or through us uh, so you can clarify some of the things if there will be more. Unfortunately, the time is running very fast and uh, we tried to answer a couple of questions, but uh, more, of course, can be in the future. Sure. So thank you so much to all. And uh, with this, I would uh, end this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.